You know, it may have been Job in the Old Testament who was the first to ask the question, but it's been asked by people ever since then. Why do good people suffer and wicked people prosper? Job, in his own life, just could not understand why the cattle of the ungodly people around him were all safe and sound, why he had lost his entire herd. He couldn't understand why the homes of the wicked around him were safe while all ten of his children were killed at once by a fierce windstorm wind that collapsed the house that they were in. He asked in Job 21, why do the wicked live on growing old and increasing in power? They spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Yet they say to God, leave us alone. We have no desire to know your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What would we gain by praying to him? But even though Job didn't understand, a lot of what happened to him in the, the early chapters of his book, the thing we admire about Job is that he held on to his faith even when he went through such horrible tragedies. Even though he didn't understand, even though when he looked out at things, it did not look fair. He held on to his faith. In Job 1, he said, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. <clears throat> Haven't you asked the same questions, or some like them? I mean, if God is truly all-loving and all-powerful, why do bad things happen to you when you're trying to do the right thing? Maybe you study long hours to earn a passing grade, and, and, but a cheater never cracks a book and passes easily. Just doesn't seem fair. You work hard at your job, you're always on time, you're ready for a new challenge, but the promotion goes to that person in your section who cozies, cozied up to the boss and hardly ever did any work. Oh, you've got your own things that you would plug into that. Things that to you just aren't fair. Why do the righteous suffer and the unrighteous seem to prosper so often? And sometimes life just doesn't seem fair. God doesn't seem to bless those who serve him, and he doesn't seem to punish those who are defiant toward him. So some sit back and reason, why bother? And there are a lot of people in our world today that are kind of in that camp. It just doesn't matter. Why? Why try to do the right things? I mean, it just doesn't pay off. Why should I do this? Peter's letter is written to Christians, of course, in 1 Peter, the book we've been looking at for several weeks. And and there were in this audience, uh, the first readers and beyond, that, that had Jewish backgrounds and others had Gentile backgrounds. And so there's this mixture of people who would receive this letter and, and be dealing with things in very different ways because of uh, their sort of backgrounds. Things that had already happened to them in their lives. For instance, those from Jewish backgrounds had a great deal of experience with persecution. After all, all of their cities and their towns were under Roman rule. They were the oppressed people. And so they were used to being kicked around. They were used to things not going their way. They were used to being the lesser people in a land. So persecution to them was not some strange animal. They were oppressed because of their beliefs. They were oppressed because of what type of people they were. They knew persecution. And the Jews have always been some of the most persecuted people on earth. If you are a student of history and you look back through time, it's reality. But you know, those with Jew Gentile backgrounds that, that Peter was writing to here, a lot of them had no experience with persecution. 
I mean, they grew up with pagan backgrounds and pretty much whatever will be, will be. They did what everybody around them did and, and, and they just kind of fit in. And so there just really wasn't a lot of day-to-day -day persecution for them in any way. And so they would need to have some understanding built into them about what they were facing. After all, now they're Christians. And they've given up everything to follow Jesus and and they're being persecuted and, and they're still suffering and they've got questions as, as to why all this is happening. And Peter knows as he writes this letter, he's addressing this, this whole group of people. And Peter knew that they needed to understand that the life for Christ yields the greatest and the most lasting rewards, but it's not an easy path. No one has painted for them that this is easy street now that you become a Christian. And they needed to know that when suffering came, when it came for their faith, that God had not abandoned them or grown powerless. That when hardships came, God had, for not, had, for not, had not forgotten them. They needed to know this. They needed some of God's perspective about suffering and persecution. You know, I think today the Christians quite familiar with suffering for their faith live in areas of our world where Islam and the Hindu religions are the strongest and certainly the most dominant. And when those individuals make the decision to be a follower of Christ, they're turning their back on everything that they had known. And they know full well that they are facing a life of bitter suffering and they're probably going to lose their lives in the process. And they know this because they have seen it happen to their friends, people in the town. They've heard stories from village to village as these groups come in and they know the time is coming. But Christians in the U.S. and most of the Western world have experienced little or no persecution because the Christian faith was dominant in society. And let's be honest, we all hope that we don't have to suffer for our faith. But at some point, maybe in our lifetime, maybe not, we may be called upon to choose between being loyal to what the Bible teaches, God's word, or succumbing to the pressures of our culture. It's coming. And so Peter gives some helpful insights here to Christians then and now about suffering as human beings. I did not get your uh, outline in the bulletin this week because we had to print bulletins so early in the week. Didn't have my sermon ready, enough for that. So you will have to do a little more writing today if you're taking notes and you're writing down your, uh, uh, the points today. So just want to go ahead and just say, I didn't get it done, okay. All right, the first one is suffering cannot be avoided in this life. Suffering cannot be avoided in this life. There's still some people that are quite surprised when they experience devastating tragedies or losses because they have been blessed perhaps with years of minor difficulties and problems. And I realize that there is no minor problem or difficulty if it's yours, okay? I just right up front. I just acknowledge that, you know, it's our personal experience. It doesn't seem minor to us no matter. But we realize that sometimes the things that we have experienced are not quite as difficult, hard, overwhelming as some things other people we know have faced. And we know as well that some people, when bad things happen to them, shake their fists at God and they accuse him of being totally unfair. I have people I know, and you do too, I've talked to. And in times of their great tragedies, they have simply said, if that's the kind of God that he is, I don't want part of him. Something tragic happened to their parent growing up or to their, to their child, and they just, they just turn away and they get bitter 
And they don't want anything to do with the Lord. Not everyone responds that way, but there are people who do. And you know them and I do too. And Peter's simply saying here that we need to be realistic. Suffering is just going to be a part of life. It's, some things are going to seem smaller than others, but it's going to come. And there's reasons why it comes. Well, we should not be surprised by it. In 1 Peter 4.12, he wrote, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. He says, you can cut any slice of humanity you want, and guess what? There's going to be suffering in the fruitcake. It's just there. I mean, it's just there. And severe difficulties come from at least five different sources. Two of them are mentioned in the passage that we are reading today. And several of them are not. They're just throughout the Bible. But first of all, we realize that we can suffer because of our Christian witness. We can suffer because of our Christian witness. In 1 Peter 4.14, he wrote, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ... You're blessed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, it's going to happen. You're blessed. You know, ISIS militants are so much in our news today and have been for some time this year. But they have forced many Iraqi Christians to flee their homes when they overran the cities of Mosul and Karakash in June of 2014 this year. But persecutions continue with the harassment, unfair taxation, arrest, banishment, and violence against any who run afoul of Islamic authorities that choose to hold tight to their Christian beliefs even in the face of threats and grave dangers. And many Christians who escape the perils they face in Iraq and other ISIS-controlled areas tell stories of demands to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ and convert to Islam or face oppression, arrest, imprisonment, or death. If you follow the news at all, you, you can't miss a lot of this that's going on in different parts of our world. It's in the Middle East. When Jay was here, he didn't talk a lot about it, but it's going on in India. There's so many different places where these groups have gained, uh, you know, a, a dominant place. And Christians are being persecuted because they are Christians. They represent something that to other religions are a threat. And they deal with it through force. But it doesn't just happen overseas. Persecution takes forms in this country as well. For instance, the owner of Arlene's Flowers in Washington State politely declined to make arrangements for a same-sex wedding, exercising her First Amendment rights. She has been involved in a legal battle for almost two years now, and the fight may cost the owner, whose name is Baronel Stutzman, more than customers. Longtime customer Robert Ingersoll and his partner are not only suing Arlene's flowers, but Baronel personally, and it may cost her her home that's in this country. And things like this, in the form of persecution because of Christian beliefs, and the exercise of those is a, in this country, which have been protected for so long, are not as strong as they used to be. You know, believers in the first century were insulted a lot because they belonged to Christ. And the world didn't understand that. And, and today there's still a lot of people that don't understand Christianity. They, they say things that aren't true and they, they just don't want to to feel the, the judgment sometimes they feel because their lifestyle doesn't match what the Bible teaches. The lifestyle that, that we would represent as his people. And it, it's not that we feel ugly toward other individuals as Christians. It's just the truth of the gospel and what Jesus taught. It was Jesus who told us that you are the light of the world. And someone else responded to that and said, if you're going to be the light of the world, you're going to attract a few bugs. And certainly that has happened and will continue to happen. 
And some people say, well, who do you think you are to speak for God? And as Christians, we realize we don't speak for God. But we believe God has already spoken to us through the Bible. And that is the truth we represent to the world. Whether it's appreciated or not, we just need to make sure always we do it respectfully and in love as we talked about last week. We suffer because of our Christian witness, but we also suffer because of our own sinful behavior. In 1 Peter 4.15, he wrote, If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer, or thief, or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. Peter's simply saying here that there's some things you and I will suffer because of choices we make. If we choose to break the law, there's a good chance we're going to pay some consequences. I'm not going to ask the hands of anyone who in this room has been pulled over speeding. But typically, unless you just happen to hit an officer on a good day, or you had the right kind of cry, or the right kind of smile, or something, or you actually knew the officer, you're going to pay some money. You probably are going to traffic school, like I've done a couple times. Um, but you're going to pay consequences. If you lie to someone, there's a good chance you're going to be caught in your lie. Trust is going to be eroded. If you, um, and he mentioned several things here that maybe to us sound kind of extreme, but murdering, th stealing, being a criminal, a meddler, just basically interrupting human interactions with each other. But he's saying there's things that you can choose that you face the consequences for and you are suffering because of that and it's all your choice. So clean up your choices. Be wise in the things that you do. Thirdly, we can suffer because of satanic attack. The Bible alludes to this. Satan brought one uh, trial after another into Job's life, and we read about that in the first few chapters of the book of Job. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12 that his thorn in the flesh was a messenger from Satan to torment him. And Jesus said that Satan's agenda among us is to steal, kill, and destroy. So we shouldn't be surprised as Christian people that he would choose to attack us. Now, we don't always know it's satanic attack because he doesn't send us a, a letter in the mail and say, okay, this is going to happen to you because I'm sending it, signed Satan. I mean, we don't get notices like that. But Paul goes to great lengths in Ephesians 6 to say, you need to be wearing the armor of God. You need to put it on every single day because there is conflict going on you're not going to be able to readily see and recognize, but it's going on and you're part of it because you're a follower of Christ. Now again, I don't know what form that may take for you. But let me ask you, if you've ever made a commitment to begin a Bible reading plan, how many of you found it was easy sailing? Weren't there more interruptions that seemed to turn you away from what you had set out to do? If you plan to do it early in the morning, you know that I'm going to get up a half hour earlier and I'm going to read the Bible. And you maybe did it twice the first week. But you're just so tired. And you just really need that extra sleep. And it's amazing that often when you try to do something that's good, draws you closer to the Lord, that something discourages you. Now we don't often sit around and think, well that's Satan's attack on me. We just think we're really tired. I'll read it later. And the later never comes. Maybe, just maybe, someone's trying to stop you because it's harmful to his agenda. Now granted, some people take this to an extreme. They blame everything on some demon. 
you know, I was running late for work today, and you know, man, I just thought I just could barely make it, but I'm just really behind, and I hit a train. It was that traffic demon. You know, everything's a demon, you know. And so, yeah, we can go to some extremes with that, but let's not be so naive to think that we wear the name of Christ and we are daily going out, striving to represent him well, that we are not going to face obstacles from Satan because we are trying to do that for him, for God. Well, fourthly, sometimes we suffer because we live in a fallen world. You know, Adam and Eve introduced a sin virus into this world, and we will all live with the consequences of their disobedience Philip Yancey wrote that since Genesis 3, we all live on a stained planet. In Romans 8, the Bible says that all creation is groaning because it's out of alignment. Ever since sin entered the world, things are off kilter from what God originally created. And all of creation is longing for the day when everything's restored as it ought to be. And so there are dangerous bacteria and cancer-causing agents and tornadoes and floods and drunk drivers in this world that every single human being has to be a Christian or not because we live in a fallen world. Sometimes we suffer as well because of God's loving discipline. A caring father will not allow his child to be defiant very long. He will punish and bring some form of temporary pain to correct this dangerous behavior because if it is not stopped when it begins raising its head, trouble is coming down the road. And so a caring parent curbs that early. And our Heavenly Father sometimes punishes us to correct wrong conduct. You know, when Jonah went the opposite direction from what God wanted from him and what it instructed, he suffered a terrible storm at sea and three uncomfortable days in the belly of a fish. And when the fish vomited him on the shore, he said, I think I'll follow God now. God was correcting his disobedience. And he's still doing that today. You're not always going to be able to pinpoint exactly what, why you're suffering the way you are. I mean, I think sometimes we know things happen because of choices that we've made. We can own up to that. But we don't always know if God is pruning us or he's punishing us or we're just experiencing the bitter fruit of a fallen world. It's not always going to be real evident. But the point is, it's coming. And you need to be ready for it. Suffering's going to come. The second main point this morning is that God desires our hardships to be purposeful. He desires our hardships to be purposeful. You know, when you and I hurt, in those times we can more deeply appreciate what Jesus experienced on our behalf. For instance, if you suffer from some physical pain, you can better identify with the excruciating pain that Jesus felt from the top of his head when the crown of thorns were placed and pierced through the skin on the top of his head all the way down to the nails being driven through the arches of his feet. Oh, we probably will not experience the excruciating pain to the extent that he did, but we can face some pretty physically damaging things. And just our own pain helps us to better relate to the fact that our Savior suffered great pain for us. In a sense, we can feel some bond to him because of our own physical suffering. 
If you suffer emotional stress, you can identify with Jesus who suffered daily stress, hostile critics, slow learners, incessant demands, and constant interruptions. When you experience alienated relationships, imagine what Jesus went through for you. His own brothers mocked him. Judas betrayed him. Peter disowned him. And all of his closest friends ran away when he was arrested. It's through our pain that we often draw closer to Jesus. Corey Tim Boom was a, a Dutch Christian. And she, along with her family members, helped many Jews escape the, the Nazi Holocaust during World, World War II. But eventually, she, was, she and her family were captured and sent off to concentration camps because of their efforts. And she said that one of the first things that happened when she and her sister Betsy were confined to a Nazi concentration camp is that they were stripped of every single piece of their clothing and they were made to walk in single file in front of the leering, mocking prison guards. And she said it was so humiliating to experience that. But as they walked in that line, Corey whispered to her sister, remember, they took Jesus' clothes too. And Betsy responded, oh, Corey, and I never thanked him. You see, in their growth as disciples of Jesus, they had never before been able to relate to Jesus' humiliation until they too experienced more humiliation than they had ever known. You see, it's in our suffering that often we can be drawn closer to Jesus. Peter wrote in chapter 4, verse 13, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. You see, when you hurt, you have an opportunity to mature. Now, you don't always mature through suffering, but you have the opportunity to do so. It can become a sharpening in your life. It can lead you to greater growth in so many ways in your life than you would have ever experienced otherwise. You see, when you are at your weakest, when you're hurting the most, it's in those times often you turn to God and trust Him in ways that you never did before. You ask Him harder questions than you've ever asked Him before. You have prayed more. You have read your Bible more. You have talked with more Christian people. You've read more books than at any other time in your life because you want answers. You want help. You want to know where to go and lean and trust more than you've ever wanted those things. And the end result often is that you find yourself realizing the presence of Jesus in a greater way than you ever have. His presence rests with you and helps you to face things then and in your future. Peter wrote in chapter 4, verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. See, suffering has a way of bringing you into the presence of God in a way that you've never ever experienced before. And I've often heard it can make you better or make you bitter. Depends on what you choose. Lastly, this morning as we look at this passage, Peter is saying, trust in your creator. Trust in your creator. The Bible is clear that God is going to bring justice to this world someday. The righteous who have lovingly obeyed God and patiently endured hardships and kept their faith will be commended. 
It was James who wrote, as you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. James is saying, if you persevere, here is the story of one who has been through horrible tragedy. And we can watch the, the progress of his life and his thinking and, and advice that he received and his questioning of God. And we can see that later in life, through patience and faith in God, that God gave him twice as much as what he had at the beginning. In other words, God never left him. God was there. And there was blessing in the end. Greater than what Job could have ever imagined. We are promised in scripture that if we are faithful in suffering, one day God will honor us. It may not be in this world, in this lifetime, but when judgment day comes, it will be a day of glory for those who have been proved faithful in the midst of suffering. But the wicked that have prospered and have never given God thanks will be punished. Peter wrote in chapter 4 verse 18, and if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Peter said it wasn't easy for the righteous to be saved. Those who have become righteous because they have accepted the gift of Jesus and turned over their sins and received the righteousness of Christ. And this was only made possible through what Jesus did on the cross. And that was not an easy thing. What Jesus did for us was not an easy thing. It was a very difficult thing. There's nothing more excruciating than what Jesus endured for you and I, for the, everyone in the world who would receive it. It was not easy for those who received that to have what they have. The lifeblood of Jesus was the payment. And that's the only reason we have salvation is because of what Jesus did. That was the price. It wasn't easy. But if it wasn't easy for those who've received, what about the rest of people? If the ungodly reject Jesus, they're going to receive their lifelong request to live without God. They'll be separated from him for all eternity. Peter's saying they're going to simply receive what they've wanted. No God in their life. He concludes this section of verse 19. He says, then, so then, those who suffer accordingly to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. The word creator reminds you and I that he is the one who put you and me together. And he faithfully takes care of us. And he's worth committing to your life too. Continue to do good. Continue to do the right things. Even when you don't understand. Because he's worth committing to. And you and I are called upon to hold on. He's helping us now. He's not abandoning us. He didn't abandon Job. He's not abandoning you. He's not abandoning me. And someday, he's going to make all things right. But along the way, he's going to give us exactly what we need, that moment, that day, to get through this when it comes. It's very, diff it's very hard in this world to get by, to endure the sufferings and the difficulties and it's important that we realize that the greatest help we have is from the one who made you and me, who has never stopped loving us. And he loved us enough to send his son to die for us on the cross. And so this morning, if you've never done that in your life and given your life to Jesus and admitted your belief in him, repented of sin, confessed your, your loyalty to him, and been immersed into Christ today, that is an option available to you. But for the rest of us who've made those decisions, 
It's important that we continue to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters across this globe who may not live through this day because of their loyalty to Jesus Christ. It's important that we build close relationships with God and his people because we need him and we need each other. And it's important that we understand the bonds of what we have in Christ. But it's also important that we do our best to love people who are still so far from God, who need to see the light of Jesus in this dark world. Let's pray. Father, what a difficult subject. Because none of us suffer well. None of us choose it. But we know it's a part of our life reality. But Father, I know that as difficult as it is, and I know people in this room have suffered horribly for many different things. Some are now. And who knows what lies in our future on this world. And that's what you're preparing us for. But thank you so much, Father, for helping us through those times. Whether it's something we bring upon ourselves or it's attack of Satan or it's pruning or punishment or just the fact we live in this world that so desperately needs to be restored. We know ultimately we need you above everything else. Not because you give us all the answers that we want. But Father, how you teach us that you, you are enough. Father, we don't give up things we love very well. And certainly we live with our own fears of suffering and persecution to become more real each and every day. But Father, help us to remember that this life really is not our goal. Our goal is to receive the life to come. And how we face things in this world determines not only our eternity, but those who watch us and learn what a Christian is all about. Do we have some different hope than they have? Do we have some ability to cope with suffering better than they do? They're wanting to see something that's real and has eternal hope and impacts the way we not only receive blessings, way we receive pain and suffering in this life. That's what they're looking to see. And I pray, Father, that we will be representatives that represent you well. And that is our prayer today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if you'd like to receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'll be down front to greet you, greet you and lead you in whatever steps that you would need to take to receive what Christ has offered to you. This morning as well, if you have a, a desire in your heart to be a part of this family, we'd love to welcome you to the family. We'd be happy to talk to you up front or in the back following the service. If you are one of those people that are sitting there that have done all those things, what has the Holy Spirit been telling you today? Because he's been trying to tell you something that he believes you really need to hear. He knows. Receive it and act upon it. We're going to be standing together as we worship, and if you have a public decision, would you come as we sing together?